sacred day. I want to welcome you to the long road. I'm here with Wayne um, Woolrich, the co-superintendent of SAU 29. And we're going to have a lot of in-depth discussion about some of the education, both at the local level and the state and federal level today. And um, <clears throat> one of the first things we want to talk about is no child left behind. You've got people that love it. You've got people who hate it. There's almost no middle ground. And it's coming up for um, reauthorization. But when no child, um, no child left behind, it was approved by about 90% of the congressmen and the senators. It just doesn't seem to hit. It didn't hit the ball out of the park. It just seemed like they filed quite a bit. Well, it's true. It was uh, co-authored by Senator Kennedy and Senator Gregg uh, yeah. and was enacted in 2002 uh, under a great deal of fanfare with high expectations that uh, this legislation would really move the United States into one of the forerunners again uh, in public education. A, de a generation ago, we were number one uh, in the percentage of students who went on to college and graduated from college. And during that time, about 10 nations have passed us. Uh, so the nation was looking around at a way to develop an accountability uh, standard relative to public education and looked at No Child Left Behind, really two provisions that really stood out. The first one was an adequate yearly progress provision, uh, and I'll speak to that in a minute. And the other was a highly qualified teacher provision. Um, the issues as you go back uh, to find out you know, how this legislation, which was so sweeping, emerged, you have to go back to the individual state cases that were much like our Claremont case uh, in New Hampshire in 1997. Those are cases where it was determined that the state um, had the obligation to fully fund an adequate education and that an education was a fundamental right uh, of every citizen and it was compulsory and therefore uh, states had to fund uh, public education as each one of these cases was determined uh, in the various states. As part of that conversation, um, states said, well, if we're funding education, it's, it was clearly uh, there embedded in their constitution that they needed to fully fund. Uh, that there were these huge inequities, uh, whether you're talking about California, Texas, Kentucky, where this whole thing started, Tennessee, on and on you go in through, right on through to New Hampshire, you'll find that there are huge inequities. I'll argue, and we'll speak to this later, that New Hampshire probably had the greatest uh, degree of variation, but nevertheless, because of these inequities, as these cases came through, it was determined that if the state was going to begin to pay um, the fully funded part of adequacy, that they would have to find a way to make sure that the money they were spending was actually uh, procuring the result that they had hoped for. And to do that, uh, President Clinton, under the Goals 2000, began with kind of a standardized assessment at grades four and eight to determine where states were relative to some common standards. That sort of percolated into uh, other conversations, beginning with uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, California, and then Texas uh, around 2000 where the states began to give assessments that were more uh, public than state assessments uh, like the one that we had, uh, the NEAP assessment in New Hampshire. And what happened in Texas around 2000 was the then Governor Bush um, really became very enamored with some of the successes or gains that he was seeing in the state of Texas and brought uh, Rod Page, who became the Secretary of Education, um, and then uh, Governor Bush, who became President Bush, uh, and as his, uh, the first real, um, or the first real um, part of his uh, um, presidency was to move this legislation through Congress, and he did so um, with the help of Democrats and Republicans, because both sides felt um, that the United States was not competing, that there were things that we needed to know about our education system. And since the 1984 uh, Nation at Risk report uh, under President Reagan, there had been a loss of some of the credibility um, that had been really a foundation of public education in America. So educators like myself welcome the opportunity to prove some of the value 
which is hard to prove uh, when every district and every state has a different type of assessment model and it's not fully reviewed. So, um, you know, there are some real positive possibilities. There were a couple of things that were uh, considered to be sort of flaws in the design. The first um, was that the legislation came with a price tag of about $577 per student. This was according to the New Hampshire School Board Association. Uh, and a revenue stream of about $75 per student. So with about a $500 shortfall for per each student and no way to, you know, magically generate that revenue, it created uh, quite a bit of consternation in the, in the education community, among district voters, uh, you know, our taxpayers, who said, you know, we're going to have to cut this somewhere else. And whenever you get competing interests that, where those things happen so quickly, I mean, this was enacted almost overnight, um, that there were a lot of opponents in addition to the proponents. And so the, um, the debate shifted quickly from all of the wonderful things that could happen as a result of No Child Left Behind to here are some things that we're losing because of No Child Left Behind. Music programs, for example, were falling by the wayside in many of our communities. In SAU 29, I think we've been very fortunate that we kept intact most of the things that really um, are part of that whole child experience that we feel uh, that are extremely important. But nevertheless, um, we had some very difficult times. Uh, one of the issues, we had about 35 teachers at the middle school, for example, who didn't meet the highly qualified oh, teacher status. We had one teacher in the SAU who had been given a special award, had a picture in her office, uh, a math teacher. Um, as being an exemplary math teacher and having done, uh, had a career of unbelievable accomplishments. Uh, she had to go through this process to become highly qualified under this new law. So we had uh, a number of teachers who were very uh, distraught, that had spent a career doing what they thought was appropriate and getting the kind of coursework and professional development they thought was appropriate, only to find um, that they were coming up short relative to the lens the federal government was putting on it. That was a highly qualified teacher component. The adequate yearly progress component was also troublesome for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first um, reason was it really narrowed in on two groups or small subsets of the population uh, in New Hampshire that um, had a, quite a bit of attention already. Um, the one was the special ed population, and the other was the population of students on free and reduced lunch. So when adequate yearly progress was enacted, uh, each state uh, took the average proficiency in math and reading, and then from that point, 2002, uh, to 2014 had to move from wherever they were, let's say at 70, 72 percent, to 100 percent proficient. Uh, the states were given the option of enacting one step per year or as in New Hampshire's uh, case we did every three years we'd have a bump. Uh, and then if the district did not make adequate yearly progress, did not make that improvement and meet that benchmark of proficiency in reading and math, uh, that uh, school or district was given the label of a school in need of improvement or a district in need of improvement. Now in SAU 29, as in most places in New Hampshire, we've not had a school miss adequate yearly progress for two years in a row. However, we have had subsets, um, most frequently um, our special ed population, that missed that growth uh, and as a consequence we have had schools that have been named schools in need of improvement. One argument with the legislation is that this label always is printed above the fold, um, and rarely do those people who are not directly associated with education read the fine print. And the fine print here might be, and in one of our schools where we had 160 students and this school had the top, was the top performing school um, in reading and at one time in math, but had 11 students in, that were special needs or special education students. And the 11 students collectively scored below that bar, and as a consequence, the school missed adequate yearly progress. The sanctions relative to adequate yearly progress are significant. Uh, if a school makes, misses it two years in a row, they have to put together a huge school improvement plan. They have to designate part of their Title I money to this plan, the professional development that comes out of it. I have found that, that the school improvement plans actually have a great benefit. The issue, of course, is the amount of money that comes to support the plan. Um, then if they miss it a third year, and, and at, at that point, uh, ta or 
students have the right to attend other schools in the district and at the transportation expense of the district. Uh, we haven't had a real issue with that in Keene uh, or in any of the towns in SAU 29. The next step, if we miss it again, uh, would be free tutoring for those students who want tutoring after school, before school. And then finally you get to a situation like Fall River uh, where there's restructuring of the school. So definitely the stick is, is big and the carrot doesn't seem to be as big. And that's been our argument. As with uh, special education when it was enacted, the government, the federal government said they pay 40%, they pay 18%. Um, we just felt that the legislation, uh, w we needed the funding source to really fully enact the legislation in a way that would make sense and would be least disruptive. Most educators uh, believe that there is certainly value um, in the federal government looking hard at ways to improve learning at a federal national level. Um, and we would just hope that in the future revenue would follow. The new No Child Left Behind, uh, which will be argued over the Next, this session and will likely be enacted by the end of the session has four components and is seems to be uh, much more in line with what um, educators uh, I think what the community uh, really wants the first component of this new legislation is a growth model and we've been purporting a growth model in SAU 29 for eight years, ever since the No Child Left Behind came up with that benchmark. Because what you have, if you, let's say you need to reach an 80% proficiency in reading, it's very difficult to continue to put the same effort and resources toward the 20% that have made proficient and will likely make proficiency without a tremendous effort. We believe that every student in SAU 29, whether they're two years below grade level, two years above grade level, deserves that same attention. This new model is a growth model, and it fits really well with what we already do. We've already been doing the growth model thing uh, for a couple of years, and for some, in some of our districts for three or four years. We have one of our boards that has a growth model as their major instructional goal, that every student will reach their goal for the year. We use an assessment that's a measure of academic progress. Two and a half million students uh, take this, a computer-adjusted assessment, much more it gets to the point of where a student is much more quickly with much less effort and time. Uh, the, we give it in the fall right away and we give it in the spring. Unlike the state assessment, the NECAP assessment, which is also very good, but the NECAP assessment or New England Common Assessment Program, uh, we're, we give that test the first or second week in October. Uh, we get the results in February or March. And then if we try to use that assessment as a diagnostic tool to determine where we might, you know, take care of some of the gaps that, we're, that we know are out there, uh, it's, it's not very helpful because many of those issues have now been resolved. But the measure of academic progress, we get the results back the next day. Uh, we get the results back with a diagnostic tool that helps us determine unit and strategies and groupings. It, it also gives each student a target growth goal, where that student should be by the end of the year. Last year in SAU 29, 58% of our students made that target growth, and there was quite a disparity among schools, and we're just now looking into that disparity. There's, there's many reasons uh, that might explain it. But the reality is that's the growth piece that is now part of this ESEA, or new No Child Left Behind, and we applaud that. We've been arguing that that's a much better idea for a long time. There's also a parent um, communication part of this new ESEA, and that is where parents will be given more information than they currently have, that parents will be partnered in a way that they hadn't had to partner under No Child Left Behind. We've been doing that in, in SAU 29. Uh, our teachers, uh, when they have parent-teacher conferences, are now uh, will be giving out their goal sheets and talking about where a student might get in reading and math. We've been doing as much as we could in the other subjects as well. We're now starting to do benchmarks around using professional learning communities. So we're, we're there, or we're not there. We are ahead of that curve, and we applaud that effort. There's another piece that is really just focuses on poorly, poor performing schools. Uh, we don't have those schools that are in that kind of dire need. We do have four districts in SU 29 that are districts in need of improvement. But last year, every single one of those districts made AYP. And as a consequence, if we do it again and if we make it again in October, we will, will not have any districts in need of improvement. That's certainly our hope. That's our goal. But we believe that those two components. There's a college and career readiness component under this new ESEA. 
And that is very, very interesting, and you've read about it recently in the Common Core, which was adopted by 34 states now, which really is a national curriculum in math and reading. This is a big jump. But what it does is it allows the, the federal government, the Department of Education, to really determine which states um, are making the strides that they need to and which are not. Uh, in New Hampshire, we've always done well on national type assessments. We certainly are we're one or two typically in the SAT. Uh, if you look at, at ways in which we compare, we typically do pretty well. But that's not, you know, we're not about just trying to look better than other states. But it does give us a better idea, we think, of you know, what the benchmark is. So it's not always in flux. And a state like New Hampshire that's decentralized, that doesn't have the resources to go in and remodel the curriculum every other year to match new research, we can benefit from these common core standards. And there's no, you know, the reason that uh, 34 states jumped in so quickly is because of race to the top funds, and I think we'll be I'll likely talk about that later. But nevertheless, the ESEA, um, with that family piece, um, you know, with the piece around the um, growth model, and then with the piece around the college and career ready core standards. The other piece of this, which you're going to read a lot about over the next couple of months, is the re looking at teacher performance. It's called the leaders, uh, teachers, and principals, um, and what this part of this uh, law, which will be obviously the most controversial, um, is an attempt to look at teachers' relative value in regards to the way in which they teach to the great, uh, grade level mm -hmm. expectations. So, for example, if you've been, if you've had a state assessment for five years, uh, you know, it's, it's possible to chart that growth that teachers have in those classrooms and there's obviously a disparity. There's some teachers have had more success with some units than others. What we are doing and the way we'd like to approach it in SAU 29 is through professional learning communities. If we have a teacher who's doing a great job in a particular unit, whether they're an almost new teacher or whether they've taught for 25 years, under our professional learning community model, that teacher reveals and shares knowledge and, and helps their colleagues move into that kind of level of exp or prof um, proficiency in, on that unit. That's a way to get our collective resources together, using data, coming up with smart goals so that we know our students are making and our teachers are making that progress. If this happens you know, quickly, if all of a sudden, as they are in Los Angeles here by the end of this month, uh, they're going to publish uh, growth uh, for 700 teachers. Um, if this happens too quickly, uh, I do think the result of the, the kind of chaos that will emerge and the anxiety that will emerge uh, will likely be counterproductive. So I just hope we can do this in a way that's sensitive to the careers and will give our teachers the opportunity to um, make adjustments where they need to to make certain that we are doing the best job we can with the uh, grade level expectations. Know that this common core uh, that's coming um, will be the beginning of the national assessment. No Child Left Behind ends in 2014 as, in regards to the assessment. What will almost certainly happen in 2015 is a national assessment. And that assessment will not be based on the New Hampshire standards. That will, assessment will be based on the Common Core. So we're making huge changes in public education. Um, we want to do it in a way that, uh, where we can prove our value. I just read an article, if I can just decide for a second, a uh, New, New York Times article from July 27th, if you want to look this up. And it, it looked at 1,200 students, um, or 12,000 students, I'm sorry, in Tennessee, uh, who had had exemplary kindergarten teachers. And then looked at where they were in their 30s and determined the value, if you looked at the amount of additional money these people uh, that they were making, not that that's uh, the only measure. I mean, there's also well health, you know, they, these people are more likely to invest in retirement programs or a number of other variables. But it was $320,000. So if you were to strictly use, uh, you know, financial value relative to the kindergarten teacher, you could say the kindergarten teacher will add about $320,000 per year based on an average size classroom. Now, this information was surprising because educators knew that kindergarten teachers had a huge impact on where students were in uh, primary grades and even through some of the beginning intermediate grades, but then that sort of fell off. What educators didn't realize 
is that some of the skills students you learn at very young relative to how they interact with others, uh, the way in, in which that kind of protocol around relationship building is developed at that age has huge consequences later on. Uh, those are sort of some of the things that are emerging from research that is much more clear thanks to national like um, you know, accountability measures. So we applaud those. Uh, we, we love seeing the, the kind of the meta-analysis of all of the research that's been done in education now more clearly focused because of some of this accountability. So I think the new ESEA is a much better model than the old No Child Left Behind. I believe much like No Child Left Behind, it'll be in the implementation. If this law is implemented without any funding source, um, it will be difficult, and there will be some confusion, and maybe from out of the result there will be the, you know, the Phoenix uh, principle, but I would like to think that we can do this in a sensible way, uh, honor the dignity of our employees, um, of those people who have committed their lives um, you know, to improve student learning. So that's where we are with No Child Left Behind. I'm sorry it took probably a little more time. <laughs> than you wanted, but uh, uh, there's a lot to that legislation. A couple of a quick comments on No Child, when you talk about the, the national standard. Yeah. We have a lot of states, we'll pick on Mississippi and, and North Carolina, they're showing remarkable improvement mm -hmm. because instead they said now, for example, use a baseball analogy, if New Hampshire you're doing well and you, your guy starts at third, he has to go home, mm -hmm. but New, Mississippi says all you have to do is get the second base to score a run. Mm -hmm. So right now, each state is really playing, playing the rules. There's, there's really no um, standard. Right. And that's really unfair. Um, <clears throat> some of the other stuff on No Child Left, people hate testing. And my bias, I'll be up front, is, is about testing. And one of the most important things I think about testing is teaching the kids how to take a test because there's some really intelligent people out there that can't pass the test because they panic or they don't know how to take a test. And, but the problem that I have with no child left behind and with its testing is the norming. Because if you use norming, there is no way in the world that everyone could ever get to, you could ever get to 100% of proficiency because under norming, if you, you start at 50, and then your average moves up to 60, it's always, as each kid gets better, it's always going to be a moving average. And all of a sudden, you may have a child who is 55 who was making it. Mm -hmm. The norm moves up to 60, and now that child is no longer making it. There is no concrete standard where it says, this is where a 12th grade should read, or this is where 12th grade math is. And some kids may be at 14th or 15th level. But this Norman thing, to me, is just a... It doesn't make sense. Well, the, the standards movement will, will change that as we get to a national standard. I think that will help a lot. And I think you'll begin to see report out measures, uh, like report cards, for yep. example, um, that a student may still get an A, B, C, D, or an F. But they'll likely also get, um, here are the standards that have been mastered by that student that are part of that grade level expectations, regardless of the subject area the student is in. And that probably will have more meaning uh, for parents, they'll, I think, be able to be um, more likely uh, to be a partner in the education process, and I think that's uh, definitely a step in the right direction. Um, you know, percentages can be used for a lot of different things, but they don't give us uh, the kind of meaning and ability to explain what, what real, where the issues really are. The, it's kind of like the, the Army. They were having different, tr all kinds of trouble with some kids could read, some could write at different levels. So they created a go, no, go book. Right. Every service member, every soldier got a go, no, go. So maybe you're outside doing something, you're the teacher, and you say, oh, PFC Jones did this. And so he got the check. So each grade level had certain requirements, and maybe sometimes PFC Jones passed it by taking a test. And so isn't it part of what we're doing now on some of the individual learning plans, there's people are going to get credit for accomplishing things. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the classroom. That's right. And I, I, I applaud that type of professional development. We really believe that that job embedded professional development really has ultimately a better payback uh, than the kinds of things that we may have done, you know, a decade or so 
where different teachers went different things and may have done something that personally was relevant, but didn't really focus on the goals of the district, of the school, of their professional learning team. Um, so this will be, a, I think, a better model as we move because forward. The, um, what you're talking about, each one has a standard. And I just got this article from King, Sent King, King Sentinel this week. Mm -hmm. Individual, this was an interviewer at William & Mary's. And he says, it seems like everyone who applies as the captain of the cross-country team, is a section leader in the orchestra, is in the National Honor Society, has 450 SATs, has a four-point-something ridiculous grade point average. When everyone is looking like that, who stands out? And so if you have this standard of go, no go, mom says, oh, Johnny's got a 4.0. But if it goes in and says Johnny's only met 60% of the requirements for that grade level, right. then you would expect mom to be coming in to the principal and saying, what right. gives? And even though grades are, I mean, I, I believe grades serve us well. Um, they're not nearly as valuable as an indicator of student performance as some kind of a benchmark that relative to standards. So that will tell. Um, and it's not just about allowing a student to get into an institution but it's making certain that there's a match, um, that the student doesn't go in and then fail quickly, um, but rather that there is a well thought through match of an institution that's, that's re in line with the student and, and therefore the student can succeed and move forward and graduate. The, um, before we get ready to go to our little short intermission, I went to Jeb Bush, he's the CEO of Excellence in Education. <clears throat> To me, it's, it's really unbelievable. He brings people from all spectrums. He doesn't worry about politics. He worries about individuals who want to improve the kids, plain and simple. He wants us not to compete against state. He wants us to be able to have an education that can compete against the world. Right. We need to produce engineers and scientists that will compete against China and India. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that's happening, we're getting the kids who are graduating honors and high honors but over 25% of the kids have to take remedial English and math. Yeah. And when you're talking about the new ch no child left behind and that kind of college readiness, yeah. that, that should be helping a little bit. Yeah, that's a huge part of it. I have to, <laughs> uh, as an aside, last year over 50% of the PhDs in engineering in the United States were given to foreign nationals. Yeah, sure. That in China, 110 million students are taking at least 40 minutes of English a day, all second grade through high school students. They're now taking the AP, the USAP the exams, and they're getting credits that are transferable to U.S. colleges. This past summer, the first student from China, from a regular public school in China, was accepted into Harvard. That made the headlines no. on every newspaper, <coughs> at least according yep. to my education people, yep. in China. Um, we are definitely having, this is a flat world, <laughs> and it's no longer the Berlin Wall, and we're doing our thing, and others are doing theirs but students are getting online in India and China, anywhere on this planet, and competing with our students. So it's true. We need to make certain that our students are advantaged, not disadvantaged. So I like that part about the ESEA. I think it's time we understood that we're part of a global society. That uh, I mean, I love Keene, New Hampshire. I moved here 20 years ago thinking it's the most <laughs> idyllic place on Earth. I still believe that. Well, maybe not on Earth, but at least in my experience. <laughs> And, uh, but I, I really think it's time that we, we understand things have shifted dramatically and with such haste that we try to get out in front is going to be diff difficult. Yep. Our kindergartners graduate in 2024. Uh, um, it's not going to be easy to predict what they'll need in 2024. But what we know that, that seems pretty certain to us is those fundamental skills around critical thinking the ability to consume and understand what you read, um, the ability to interact with others, and then that kind of core knowledge base that allows you to shift one way or the other. That, that's not going to go away. So I think we, we focus on those kinds of things. And that's where I think that college career ready is, is all about. And that's you know some things we're doing with Keene State right now, some things we're doing with Antioch that um, are kind of helping with those connections. And I don't if we get to race to the top, I'll talk a little bit about what's happening uh, with Marlboro and Keene State. So what we're going to do is we're going to take about a three-minute intermission. We're going to have um, a little slideshow on national parks. I know you've been to a couple, so we'll, hopefully you and some of the guests will try to guess which parks that these are from, these slideshows. Yeah. Right. Okay, I think we're doing pretty good. We're just sliding right along. There's a lot of information on it.
One of the things that just happened recently, it was about $26 million. Congress came back to approve, not $26 million, $26 billion. And part of that was to pay for unemployment, and the other part was to pay for teachers. And each state was getting a proportion of it. And I've been reading this article in, in the New York Times. Most of the states and the districts that are getting the money are not spending any of that money to rehire teachers. Do you know what the state of New Hampshire is doing? How much is going to be making down? To well, the local there, we, level? we were our allocation was forty-one million dollars, which translates into about seven hundred employees. What will likely happen, and I hope it doesn't happen, but will likely happen. Um, is that that money will go into assist adequacy, to supplant adequacy, which would result in money, that $41 million, um, flowing out into the state other uh, needs. And I know there are other needs. Um, I would argue that that makes, doesn't make it a jobs mm -hmm. bill. If it's an education jobs <laughs> bill, um, and really the states are given two options. They can, one, allocate the money in, in their Title I structure, which would be very good, good for Keene, um, or they could use it for adequacy. Uh, and I think uh, based on our experience with the Recovery Act money, the state uh, took $160 million uh, from the Recovery Act, the stimulus mm -hmm. uh, plan, and put that into adequacy. So the money that comes to the state that's mandated through the Constitution, that $3,450 per student, um, will be subsidized likely through this jobs bill. Now, what I'm hopeful, and I know it's, it came very late, and as a consequence, it would be very difficult to redirect classrooms to create smaller class sizes in a, you know, in a few weeks, and there were definitely some issues with that. However, there are places where even for a year um, we could benefit students if indeed some of that money comes as, as a jobs bill. But I guess, I mean, I'd like to believe that's what will happen, but the past practice, and it's a tough time, you know the budget better than I do at the state level, um, I, I just don't think that's the likely scenario. The, um, we, we, I know I was going to talk about some other ones, but we'll, we'll just go right to the, the budget. You hit, we took $160 billion, million dollars out of the stimulus mm -hmm. to fund adequacy, which is really creating a $160 million um, hole when it comes up to yeah. next budget. The second part is we did away, we suspended school aid for any new school building aid. The last two sessions, instead of funding the 45 million a year out of the operating budget, we basically, we, we bonded it. Yeah. And the, the state treasurer says if we keep bonding it by year 219, 220, our principal and interest will be more than the 45 million dollars that it would cost for um, school yeah. building. But now when you look at communities like Unity and a lot of small communities around, because you said New Hampshire is decentralized, they can't afford right. building. And <clears throat> Keene's lucky, they, they've got to start, they've got to jump. I personally don't re feel really comfortable that the state is going to honor its commitment for the next 20 to 25 years. I would, I would like to think they would, but looking at the numbers, it is really tough to think they're going to honor that. If they don't honor it, that's going to have a negative effect on the keen taxpayers. But the way it's going, <clears throat> adequacy, I don't know how we're going to come up with it, but adequacy won't be adequate because you, you can't fund an education on $3,400. There is, to me, it's all insulting, laughing, and say, hey, we designed designed an adequate education and only cost thirty four hundred bucks. You just can't do that, right? And that's a that's a, a huge dilemma for folks in New Hampshire. The state um, passed down a lot of these costs late after we had already passed our district budgets. Mm -hmm. um, catastrophic aid, for example, will likely be around sixty percent of fully funded. Instead we of the eighty percent, yeah, you know, we were told to budget eighty. So there's that's over uh, that's several hundred thousand in Keene, for example. Uh, the retirement, uh, they, it's another 5% that the state has passed down. They've gone from 35 to 25 in two years. They're going, it sounds like they're going to continue. And the building aid is very troublesome. I mean, I've been dealing with uh, the unity situation. Uh, they thought they had some special 
uh, ability to get building aid because of their safety concerns. But uh, as it turned out, the Attorney General last week uh, <coughs> denied uh, yeah. that application. Uh, there is no building aid, basically. Yeah. And as a consequence, on the 23rd, um, this next Monday, uh, there. Today. Like this tonight, I mean, <laughs> tonight, uh, their <coughs> district voters are going to be faced with fixing or, or replacing that building um, with no building aid from the state and or shutting the building down and sending their students elsewhere. So it, it, this is 120 students. That's a <coughs> good-sized <coughs> district. But I know there's some fa financial concerns. I don't, I, I don't know. I you know, really don't understand that district, so I want to pretend yep. to understand it. But I do know that without building aid, um, think of the buildings we wouldn't have here. Would we have Keene Middle School, $38.5 million, without building aid? Nope. We wouldn't have Marlboro. That was a nine vote, uh, and it only passed by 68%. Uh, we, without building aid, um, the facilities, huge issue. And some say, well, you know, it doesn't really matter. Not only is it life safety, which is, are the yep. issues in, in Unity, or the issues in Marlboro, and some, to some degree the issues at Keene Middle School, in addition to um, ability to move around if you were um, compromised in, in, uh, in regards to mobility. But you would not have passed those buildings. As a consequence, students would not have appropriate lighting, would not have appropriate fresh air, would not have appropriate noise or acoustics, all the kinds of things that really enhance a learning environment and enable students to reach that global uh, learning plateau that, that we're expected. So it's not just about a place to stay warm. It's about a place to breathe fresh air, to have decent lighting, and to have safe egress uh, and those kinds of things. And then if you look at the building systems, the ability to heat the building efficiently, the ability to maintain, uh, you know, your 40 degrees in one side of the building and your 120 in another side of the building. I mean, that's an exaggeration, but there are huge <coughs> variations based on our inadequate heating systems. And to keep those up is, is much more expensive than people understand. And the amount you lose, um, you know, in the, in the amount of oil that we burn with the kind of electricity consumption, all of that aside, the state really has an obligation to step up. I'm really hopeful, and I know Molly Kelly is kind of leading a charge to rethink this building plan. And what I think it will likely look like will be more like the building aid in Massachusetts. Now, Massachusetts funds a much higher right. level, but they also, all of those that pass uh, that look like they are appropriate go to the Department of Education. The Department of Education will then decide which ones really meet all the criteria and prioritize. And so it's funded through the <coughs> Department of Education ultimately. And I think that's probably, we're moving in that direction. But it's unfortunate that in the meantime, we have communities like Unity um, who are really left out in the cold. And um, it's, uh, it's a sad yeah. commentary. A couple of things when you look at building aid and the way we fund education. I was up at Lake Sunapee yesterday. When you look at Lake Sunapee, Lake Winnipesaukee, you look at, um, <coughs> sure, Kent. We were talking earlier, one of the communities um, on coast, coast of Massachusetts mm -hmm. where they got a big lake and they've got all, all three of them have a lot of out of state property owners, right. million dollar homes. But they're set so they have, it was Wyndham, which only had a $4 per thousand tax rate. Mm -hmm. They don't have very many kids. And right. so they've set it up and the state says there'll be no donor towns. So unlike California, where everybody pays the same school rate, so I could be from Connecticut, go up to Lake Winnipesaukee, have in Lake Living Lake Winnipesaukee. I mean, um, Lake, yeah, Lake Lake Winnipesaukee, have a three four million dollar house, have very little kids, and I'm going to have to pay very little for education. While if I live in Keene and have a $200,000 house, I'm going to pay more for education than Lake Winnipesaukee or Wyndham or right. Lake Sunapee multi-million dollar houses. Right. And my issue has <coughs> always been um, that the state, undoubtedly, it's gone through the court system twice in the last 15 years, undoubtedly is fully responsible to fund education, to fund the adequate education for every student. So it's a little like asking, let, let's say, the jail, because we had that recent experience. Let's say we go to the people in Chesterfield and say, well, your level of funding for the jail will be this, and the people in Keene will be that, and Marlboro will be that. The reality is it's a state obligation. It needs to be fully funded by the state. And when you have the last, I really looked at this in 2000. 
five because that data was really firm. Yeah. Keene had about uh, $570,000 of property valuation per student. There were other communities with nine and ten million dollars right. of property valuation per student. So if this student needs a new textbook, think about what it costs, and I'm just you know simplifying, but think about what it costs for the for the taxpayers when you multiply. Whereas in this other community, they can buy the textbook, a swimming pool, and et cetera, and still have a lower tax rate because of their property tax valuation per student. So obviously, with those kinds of inequities, and that's what the Supreme Court found in 1997, and the Justice Brock decision was artfully uh, written and, and needs to be revisited frequently, and it was <coughs> determined again in, in 2006 when Londonderry took him back to court. In 1997, Keene received $4 million state aid. 1998, we received $15 million annually state aid. All of that money went back to the local taxpayers. $10 million, if you look at your yep. tax rate that year in Keene, $10 million went into to reduce taxes in Keene. $15 million was probably not appropriate. But we you look at where we are now, we're at $10 million. So costs have gone up dramatically since 1998, and we're receiving a third less. I don't want to complain about funding. Funding's tough for everybody. There are so many needs in New Hampshire. I don't understand all of the details relative to this need and that need. But I do understand that education is a fundamental right of every citizen. It's compulsory, and it's totally, the total obligation is from the state to fund an adequate education. So if an adequate education is less than half of what it costs, even in the most dire circumstances, you know, I understand how they came up with that formula. They used uh, teachers with three years and a bachelor's as top as their no, average. Actually, we decide what we were going to pay, and then we came well, up the numbers to make it the yeah, match. Yeah, for for <laughs> citizens and educators, we we wait to get the results. Yeah. But we kind of looked at that mark you had to begin with, and where it settled out at the end, and it was remarkably because, similar. Just a coincidence. Yeah, uh, thirty students, uh, you know, in a third grade. Yeah. That's that's the average. Yeah. So you'd have to have forty if you had a twenty. I mean, there was just some things about the way in which that was determined. But I get it. They, they worked hard. The people, Emma Rouse, uh, Molly Kelly, the folks uh, who really rolled up their sleeves and tried to make this work, um, the reality is the revenue wasn't available to deliver the promise. And there were compromises that had to be made, and that's part of politics. But I don't want the people in this community especially to lose sight because what we're doing is we're being overtaxed relative to the state obligation whenever we have to pay 10 times what someone else pays for the same service. And that's exactly what we're talking about, the same service and many times what other communities are paying because they have a lake or they have a seacoast. And let's be honest, for example, Hanover, real wealthy community. Mm -hmm. And Hanover and some of these other ones, they're cherry picking they're going to communities like Keene and other and say, hey, you got one or two people, uh, great teachers. We'll offer them ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 more to come. So not only do we have to pay so much more in school tax, but we're losing some of our best teachers. All the communities, for the kids who really need the top-notch teachers, they're being cherry-picked by some of the wealthiest communities. And, you know, legally it can be done. But as a state, is ethically and morally, if we're legally required to give everyone an opportunity at an adequate education, yeah. we're not really doing it because right. m money is the money is paying. Right. Well, it's a little like the military. You know, we we pay for for our national defense, but everybody pays based on income. Everybody That's pays the same. Yeah. It's no different. Education is a state obligation. Everyone should pay the same for that obligation. I understand if you want to have a swimming pool in your, you know, you'll, you'll pay for that. If you want to have a program that's way above and beyond, you, you need to pay for that. But that adequate level of education that supports those communities that have 40 or 50 percent of students on free and reduced lunch needs to be the same adequate level of education that would support those communities that have five or less stu percent of students on free and reduced lunch. With a huge uh, reservoir of capital, um, you know, to tax. So we need to get that a little, I, you know, I, I think that's important for us in, in Keene especially and in Marlboro, in Swansea, not to lose track of that because we are being overtaxed based on, on that principle. And sometimes I've been known to maybe, I guess what the rumors is that I sometimes get too outspoken or whatever. When, when I was up at Concord, 
and I'm, I'm looking at this stuff, and I, and I told him I hated the word adequate. If, if I was going to go for open heart surgery, mm -hmm. or if I was going to have a builder to build my house, I don't want an adequate surgeon. I don't want an adequate building or an adequate electrician. I want someone who can, like we were talking earlier, be able to compete against the Chinese, the Indians at the world yeah. level. Adequate means you're always going to be way behind watching other people right. take off. The uh, chair of the <coughs> House Committee on Ed of Education defined it and was told that she was kind of given direction to define it this way. One iota above inadequate. <laughs> and that was the definition that they took off. They, they had to obviously move there for the court case. I don't know what an iota really means, but my guess is it's a fine, fine, fine line. You, you're still sitting in, you can, you can get into the ballpark for the cheap seats, but you're not going up front. Right. When I was stationed in California, California decided an adequate education was that any kid, no matter whether in the desert, the high, high inline empire, whatever, in a city, they would get an education that would make them qualified to attend any one of the junior colleges. And so you could go to a junior college in California, come out as an RN, a policeman, fireman, licensed plumber, whatever. And so to me it made sense. It was plain and simple. And they put in their book, you need to take all these courses and pass them to qualify. So yeah. they funded that. I lived in Irvine. Irvine says, wait a minute, you know what? We don't want our kids to go to junior college. We want to go to Stanford and Cal Berkeley. They paid another 7000 on their own because they had a higher standard for the kids. But the, all the other students around the state did not suffer. They could go out, go to college, whether it's a junior college, and earn a middle class income and own their own home. To me, that's what an adequate education is. Yeah, I, I agree. But I, I understand <coughs> yeah. we have a different revenue. We have uh, totally different revenue. And we're in better shape than we're California. We're in better shape right? than California. So, um, I, I think it's, we do some things right. I just think there are, you know, at times uh, we have to step up, and if we have a fully uh, obvious obligation that's established in the Constitution that's been defended twice in, at the Supreme Court cool. level in New Hampshire, you know, it's, it's time to own up to that responsibility. The, um, I'm going to go over. You had talked about the importance of um, kindergarten teachers. Yeah. And there's a couple of them. Um, I'm going to write it. Uh, oh, it's got to be. A couple of things. You've got one group of parents around the country who are getting so competitive and they're saying and they're doing everything possible to keep their child behind in kindergarten. And so when they go take the test in first and second and third grades, they seem to be ahead of everyone else. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the research says it doesn't really pay off because the other kids usually catch up. Yeah, there's, and actually there have been nine major studies done in the last decade. So the, it, this has been studied and studied. It's no surprise. But there are some, every study uh, of these last nine um, came to the same conclusion, that we retain more students than we should, and we uh, advance more students than we should. And, and what it says, you know, because it seems logical that if a student remains back, will be a year older, will have a second opportunity to get the same material. But the reality is there are three things that happen that are counterintuitive. The first one is the student picks up a perception and will, well, I would be graduating with that class, or I would be with my <coughs> friends, or I, and that perception is damaging relative to self-esteem for most students. Uh, that student, even in their own family, there is a change in the subtle perception of the student's ability, which down the road yep. has a huge impact. The other piece of, of information that's kind of surprising is it, the, the idea that that short-term gain will manifest long-term doesn't seem to hold out. That, in, in fact, bringing a student through a second year of the same curriculum, sometimes delivered in the same way, can kind of down, cause a downshift of the students relative to their real, they're being challenged, well, they're not going to be as challenged as much. Is that a good thing? Not likely if you look at brain growth and development. So you're losing that challenge. The only way that, we would, that I would recommend um, a retention is if there is a different way of, of instructing, um, which frequently means differentiation where that student is not getting the same material in the same way for a second year. That really doesn't advantage that student. 
And in the long, if you look at dropout rates, if you look at social uh, ability yeah. or inability to interact and become successful on a social level, those are, those are areas you really need to look at. So I would caution parents, if you're thinking about retention, um, if you're thinking about advancement, look at the research that's been done. Um, it is counterintuitive, but it's compelling. And it is, the analysis is now over three and four decades. Uh, maybe you have an outlier, and, and, but, and if that's the case, you know, we make that work. But you really need to think hard about that because what you think are the advantages typically are not. Uh, since we're talking about the kindergarten ones and retaining them, I'm going to give you a real hard one. I've been doing a lot of research, and one of the things that really scares parents is sexual activity in the school, especially the, the middle school. But a lot of the research says that sexual activity has nothing to do with the grade. It has to do with the age. And now we're having some kids who their parents don't start them in kindergarten until sixth grade, and then they keep them back a year. Now all of a sudden, especially if you're a boy, will be sexist. Mm -hmm. Now you're in middle school, and all of a sudden you're two years older than some of your peers, and the hormones and all this other stuff is coming on. And you may think is that that kid is a seventh grader, but in actuality he is the age of a ninth grader. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's exacerbated by the fact that the age of puberty continues to decline. Um, so it's hard to establish a program <clears throat> where students will be uh, you know, really thinking that through. If you look at the way in which our middle schools work, um, you know, we, we teach differently relative to that age group because we understand there's attention issues that are being pulled. So we build on that peer group and use the peer group kind of you know, cooperative learning more because that's where their motivation is. And so you're kind of losing that sink if, if you do that. And we covered a lot. We didn't cover it all, but maybe we'll have to come back again on some of the other stuff. We never touched race to the top. And I'd love to talk about that. We can come back <laughs> on that. And so we're down to about the last 30 seconds that you would have anything you, you'd want to add that you think would yeah. be important. School starting in a, in a week. Yeah, and I would just say on September 1, when your students go off into school, uh, please give them all the support link with the teacher, get online. If you're a Keen High person, a Keen Middle School person, you can now look at Parent Portal. You can follow your students every day. You can find out what assignments they have in, what they've missed, where their grades are. Link with us because it's only together that we can make the difference we need to get our students ready for the new future. Well, I thank you for being here. Yep, thank you. Refreshments provided by G. Housen Distributors. Premium beverages delivered.